Okay, so, all right. Before the Thanksgiving, that was actually a long time ago. Okay, I guess two pounds, you were two pounds uh, lighter, I guess, back then. So we, uh, I talked about DNA sequencing technologies. Okay, and it was a good timing. Well, okay, it's an unfortunate timing because Fred Sanger has just died two days before my lecture at the age of 95, you know, who won two Nobel Prizes. Uh, first for sequencing, you know, protein, insulin, insulin, and then a uh, second for sequencing, I mean, uh, DNA. So his sequencing method uh, was used to uh, sequence the human genome uh, that was announced in the draft form in 2001. And it cost uh, two million sorry, two billion dollars to to do that. Uh, but nowadays you can uh, do human genome sequencing for about uh, five thousand dollars, and uh, by using next generation sequencing technologies, and uh, introduce uh, these technologies. Last time, one you know by a company called Illumina, the other by uh, Iron Torrent. Illumina is based on massively parallel uh, fluorescence detection of uh, sequences. Uh, you can call it uh, sequencing by uh, synthesis because when DNA polymerase you know, copies, then you see uh, different colors of fluorescence based on uh, different sequence. And, uh, uh, and there's also another uh, competing technology based on electrical measurement of uh, sequencing reaction. Uh, by measuring the protons released every time uh, DNA is extended by one base. And that has the potential to fully utilize the advances in silicon technologies to make it you know, massively parallel because it's purely electronic uh, measurement, electrical measurement. All right, so today we'll uh, complete that uh, chapter by uh, talking about third generation sequencing technologies or next next generation sequencing technologies, again uh, uh, by two uh, two companies, one in California, the other in in UK. And then uh, the main topic today will be the introduction of several uh, gene expression analysis technologies. Uh, there are actually many more than what's written here, but today I will just talk about uh, these uh, methods. PCR uh, for polymerase, uh, polymerase chain reaction, and uh, RT-PCR, real-time PCR, and Northern blot, okay? a very classical technology, and uh, DNA microarray technology, and uh, FISH, and MS2 binding array. Okay? The next lecture, uh, that this will be my final lecture that, that I, I myself give, uh, on Thursday will be on uh, genome engineering. There are actually really wonderful new technologies to, uh, that you can use to manipulate the genomes, even the human genomes, uh, 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 relatively easily. So I will talk about the advances. And then also uh, uh, a very interesting topic uh, uh, called a synthetic cell that I think you'll find also very interesting. And the, the final lecture of the course will be given by Professor Shulton next, uh, next Tuesday. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we couldn't actually give the lecture at a, on a regular, at, at a regular slot. So makeup lecture will be that evening, 7 p.m., uh, 136 Lumis, which I believe is, is this room, right? Yes. Monday, okay, then that's correct. So that, yeah. Okay, the email is correct. Okay, any, any question? Again, the taken final will be announced soon. So let me go uh, and talk to the topic of
Where is it? Okay, here. Okay, uh, third generation sequencing technologies, or next next generation uh, DNA sequencing methods. Actually, uh, there was a company uh, called Helicos based on single molecule DNA sequencing. Uh, I actually uh, scratched up because the company went down. Okay, the stock price is now I think one cent, something like this. There's another company uh, which is actually still uh, uh, operating, uh, post Biosciences, uh, another single, single molecule sequencing uh, technology company. And in fact, this company was founded by two graduate students at Cornell University, one in physics, one in uh, uh, engineering. And they're about you know, my age, maybe a little younger. So you can. The company is worth about eight hundred million dollars. Okay. Actually, sorry, uh, two hundred. Yeah. And a third one is called Oxford Nanopores. So, limitation of the next generation sequencing technologies, such as you know, by Illumina, is that uh, you still have to amplify the sample before you put it into the sequencing machine. So you have to use a procedure called PCR, I will explain later, to do that. And uh, when you do PCR amplification, depending on the a template, the sequence, uh, the amplification uh, ratio is, is actually variable. There can be a great variation, you know, what amplification factor you get, Depending on the sequence, so there is actually there can be a really strong bias in uh, in the sample preparation, and PCR also introduces uh, mutations, and typically one uh, every uh, ten thousand <coughs> nucleotides, and and sample preparation can be difficult because it usually involves you know, getting genomic DNA and then connecting uh, two pieces of the adapted DNA molecules to the ends, which uh, the yield is not very high. And typically, uh, the read length is not very long. You know, maybe a couple of uh, hundred uh, base bases. And I mentioned that, that if you want to assemble the entire genome, then it's much better if you have long read lengths for each uh, sequence that, that you have because then you can align them much more easily. Okay. And the reaction is not synchronized. What happens is that uh, you uh, you have many, 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 many colonies, let's say 100 million colonies uh, that you uh, 100 million clusters that you're trying to sequence, but you run the reaction. Or one one base, you know, everywhere, and then you, you know, move your uh, robotic stage to to image many many different areas, you know, massively parallel way. Um, so it's asynchronous. You are measuring things in real time, and so basically you you measure one uh, base nucleotide extension per each solution flushing, you know, and so on. So that can be slow, uh, and finally. Uh, you know, uh, even now we are not at that level yet. You, know, you want to go even cheaper, like two hundred dollars, whatever. Uh, if, you know, the cheaper you make the sequencing method, then you know, the more things you can try, right? <coughs> so, so that's where the need for like storage and sequencing come, comes in. So this is actually a very uh, important paper uh, published by. Uh, this uh, company in California, Pacific Biosciences. And uh, here, uh, the first author was a physics grad student here. And then he did a short postdoc in, in Boston. And then he moved, joined the company. And then uh, I don't know exactly why he became the first name, probably uh, alphabetical. Uh, so you see, actually, there are several names one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight names with uh, a star. You know what the star means? 
primary contributor? Contact Corresponding author? No. Huh? Equal contribution. So usually uh, when there is an authorship dispute, okay, oh, I should be the first author, you know, then, then, uh, then to resolve the issue, you put uh, like two stars, oh, they, they made equal contribution. And in this case, there were eight, eight names, and it looks like they uh, actually uh, ordered their names alphabetically. Okay. So, you know, many things can happen. Because actually being a, a, the first name is actually very, very good, because many of the references are re referred to as uh, Aid et al., right? So that, and that's the only name show, that shows. Yeah. Anyway, and then, uh, and then you see these two names. They have these uh, plus signs, Jonas Kolak and Steve Turner. So they are the corresponding authors who are, you know, means that they, are, they directed the research. And usually that's how the biological papers are written. You have the student who did the work, and then the boss here, right? And so when actually when I read a uh, like table of content of, of journals, then usually uh, I look at the title very quickly, and then I just look at the, the last, last name, because then I know, you know, okay, who, what, which lab did the work, right? If I look at the first name, I have no idea, <laughs> right? So, so that's how it usually works. And then, so these two guys are actually uh, the grad, Cornell graduate students who founded the company. Okay. Uh, Steve Turner uh, is the CEO, and then Jonas Kolag is the CTO, or something like this, technical officer. They actually raised uh, private funding, venture capital, uh, $400 million to, to start the company and to, to push the technology. And then they went public. They sold uh, shares and by putting the company on the stock market. And they raised additional like $400 million. Especially the four, $800 million went into the company to, to really make it work. The, the company's now worth you know, much less. Okay, so 250 or whatever. But you know, they haven't gone bankrupt yet. So they are pushing through. And I, I, I'll let you know, uh, tell you why it hasn't really you know, taken over the world, and there's a re good reason for that. Anyway, so how does it work? Uh, so it's real-time DNA sequencing from single polymerase molecules. And the idea is the following. So you have uh, polymerase sitting on a surface. That's the pol DNA polymerase enzyme. And there's this DNA template strand. This is a primer strand. And then uh, a, a new nucle nucleotide comes and gets incorporated into the DNA strand by the polymerase. So let's imagine that that uh, nucleotide is uh, modified using a fluorescent molecule you know, in yellow color. And then when you measure signal from that uh, polymerase, as a function of time, you see suddenly yellow signal showing up. Okay? And then that you, you deduce that, OK, there was a C, cytosine, arriving and getting incorporated. Okay? The next time, uh, so that's, that's your signal here, right? And then, and then uh, that one uh, is gone. And then now the next one comes in uh, carrying a different color. So that gives you a, a blue color. And then you'll say, OK, now the next sequence is blue, uh, which is A, OK? So if you do this for all, all four colors, you'll simply look at single DNA molecule as a function of time, and then you'll see, OK, C, A, G, C, whatever, right? So that's the idea, real time, single molecule sequencing. Actually, compared to uh, the, another single molecule sequencing company that went barely down, uh, Helicos, um, uh, it was faster and then longer read, but uh, because it, it didn't require any, any of the flushing steps. Yeah. Can it resolve um, repeats? Hmm? Can it resolve repeats? OK, so if you have uh, C, 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 then ideally you will see C, the you know, yellow pulse, five times, right? In an ideal world. But you know, there's always noise. I'll talk about that. 
So the reason that the slow core uh, takes off automatically is that the polymerase cleaves it? That's right, yeah. So uh, the what's coming in has a, a triple phosphate. But when it's incorporated, you know, you, you only have one phosphate uh, remaining per per base. So diphosphate will go, go off, right? So if you attach your dye to that diphosphate, it will, it will go. You say that you know there's an issue with noise. That graph there, you know, the, the data is well above the noise and well separated in time. Is that a truly representative graph, or? You know, I, I tend to think that this is actually not real data. Okay, I show you the real data. Okay. okay. Yes. So how do you know? How do you make sure that the name of the type being added is the one that fluoresces and not anything else that's in solution? Oh, because of uh, things that are floating around, they don't stay in one place for long enough to be seen. So, mm. um, how big is the uh, diamond? About uh, one, one nanometer, 10 angstroms across. So, is there, uh, do you think they have to make it so that it doesn't interfere with the polymerase? Yes, so they, they actually made all these dye molecules uh, in-house in the company. So they hired a bunch of chemists who did nothing, nothing but you know, making different kinds of dyes. So that is really one major uh, innovation, you know, one of the many you know, things that we did. That's why they, the company had to hire like 400 people. So I saw somebody give a talk, maybe he, he, he was giving a talk, and then he showed like you know, 300 pictures <laughs> of their entire company. Of course, you know, janitors included, but. Any other question? OK, but this is not trivial, as uh, it seems. Uh, first of all, uh, these things called uh, DNTPs, they are, you know, NTPs is a nucleotide triphosphate. So N simply stands, uh, stands for one of the four letters, A, G, C, T. So if you, but D means it's a deoxy uh, nucleotide that is used to extend the DNA. And, uh, but these enzymes do not function well at all if the concentration of these guys uh, is low in solution. So you have to go above a one micromolar in concentration in solution. But it turns out uh, if you do uh, regular like single molecule fluorescent microscopy, I mentioned in the next slide, then you can no longer see uh, single fluorescent molecules on the surface when you have fluorescent molecules in concentrations higher than, let's say, 10 nanomolar. So what you need for single molecule sequencing in concentration is at least 100 times higher than you know, you know, what you can actually use in a regular single molecule fluorescence imaging. So whatever is the solution giving rise to giving you such high background, it's impossible to see single molecules. Okay? So that is uh, one a major challenge. And then second one is you know, how do you modify these DNTP molecules to put dye molecules in a way that polymerase does not actually uh, uh, get perturbed too much. Okay. Questions? So uh, there are two different ways to do uh, fluorescent microscopy with low background. One is uh, a method called total internal reflection microscopy. Light comes in and gets reflected, but if the angle here is large enough, then light does not, laser light does not propagate toward your detector. It gets reflected completely, so you can minimize you know, the excitation of uh, background fluorescence. But this, this gives you only so far, maybe you can go up to 10 nanomolar, uh, but not much more than that. And another way of doing single molecule 
detection with low background is to do confocal microscopy. You focus your laser beam to a tiny spot, about half a micron in diameter, and then, uh, then you can excite these molecules selectively. Although the light diverges and excites many things up here, but if you use a small area detector, and then you image this point precisely to the detector, then, uh, then background arising from bulk of the solution will not be detected by the detector. And so you can uh, reduce the background. And, and, and for this reason, this is called the confocal microscopy. And to form an image, you have to raster scan the sample in X, Y. But in, basically, it's still the limitation, limit for concentrations you can have in solution that still allows uh, single molecule detection is about 10 nanomolar, okay, too low uh, for, for single molecule sequencing. So the technology uh, was developed by these people uh, to make a tiny hole. So this is a glass cover slip that's an aluminum film. And the diameter of this uh, hole is about uh, 50 nanometers, okay? So that when you shine light from this direction, uh, that your laser light will only excite things around here. And, the, and actually, the laser light cannot propagate along this uh, hole because this is much smaller than, than the wavelengths. It does not support uh, the propagating wave. That's why they call it a zero mode wave waveguide. Okay? So you excite only a small area. And then, although you have very high concentration of uh, labeled nucleotides, DNTPs, you excite only a small amount, a small fraction of them, right? So background coming from this area is very, very small. Low enough, you can actually detect single molecules quite easily. So that is the concept of the, uh, this method. And how do you, you know, how do you make uh, such a device? Well, actually, it simply shows uh, you know, what it looks like in detail. So here is the fabric fabrication process. You have a cover slip, and then you uh, deposit a layer of uh, a material. And then you can use uh, uh, electron beams that you can focus to a very tiny spot uh, to uh, remove everything else except for this cylinder. And then, uh, and then you can, so that from the side it looks like that. And then you, uh, you deposit metallic film on top, so it'll look like that from the side. And then you use chemicals to etch away that black stuff, the cylinder, original cylinder. Then you're left with a hole, a zero mode wave guide. So uh, Steve Turner, uh, it's a legendary story. As a grad student, had the idea of using this uh, hole to do single molecule DNA sequencing. And then he said, oh, I'm going to file a patent. And then people at Cornell laughed at him. Oh, Steve wants to patent a, a hole. <laughs> and then like, a few days later, he came up with this name. Oh, I'm going to call it a zero wave, wave guide. And no one uh, laughed anymore. Anyway. <laughs> So names are important. Okay. So uh, in this uh, first paper, uh, they uh, made a DNA uh, with repeating uh, sequences. And the first thing that they demonstrate is to do two-color sequencing. So you know, as a function of time, uh, you know they they can actually uh, use a, a prism to uh, disperse the fluorescent signal into different wavelengths uh, directions. So you can see one color versus the other. And they, they can see that for, some, you know, for several uh, events, you see one color corresponding to G. And then you see uh, several of the Cs and several of Gs and back and forth as, you, as they design. Okay. So that was the first indication that this is actually working. And in, in terms of actual signal, it looks like that. So this is a real signal. Okay. 
Yes. So you said that the uh, observation volume is a thousand times smaller than convocal microscopy? Yes, yes. Uh, how is it compared to STED? Uh, it is uh, smaller because instead your Z can be quite uh, extensive. Right? Probably uh, more like 20 or 30 times, yeah. I think I, I gave a number in terms of uh, observation volume. So one zepto liter, the 10 to the minus 20, 21. So that's, uh, that's what the signal looks like. Okay. They also demonstrated uh, full color detection. And then uh, you can read the sequence of all four nucleotides. And you can make the course TC, TGA, whatever. Okay. So that's the idea. And you can just look at this and see, you know, how accurate a noise this process must be. Okay. So why is it not evenly distributed in time? In time, um, because the process is slightly st stochastic, right? For each step of nuclear incorporation, you know, you know, most likely it follows uh, exponential distribution. Sometimes it can be, right? You don't you don't have a periodic signal. Each each step is exponentially distributed. Sometimes you, you know, can get a long delay. So in this first paper, they, uh, they said that they read 158 bases, and then 131 of them were correctly uh, identified. And but there were uh, a lot of errors. And uh, there are different kinds of errors. Deletions, meaning that when you have, you can miss, you know, one base, or you can have insertions, and you can also have mismatches, you know, wrong, wrong, wrong calls in the same position. And these are, uh, the, some of these uh, errors actually are due to actually real biological processes. You know, if the reaction is too fast, you can miss some event, and then, uh, uh, if uh, labeled NTP comes in, and then but then it doesn't get actually incorporated, it just leaves, right? But it stays long enough for you to actually detect frustrated reaction, then it will st still count as you know a read, right? That that can be a reason. And then uh, mismatches, you know, meaning meaning that the color separation is not com uh, perfect, so you can see that. You know, these two dyes are pretty similar in, in wavelengths. So if you don't fully separate them, then you can make an error there. So there are many reasons why you can get uh, errors. And then some of these can be improved by, you know, maybe making mutations to the polymerase to, to allow it to have a, a better property, or by making uh, improvements to the you know, DNTPs and so on. So, anyway, so that was the first paper. I believe the company has made a, a lot more progress, so now things can be done much better. Okay? Okay, let's see if I can.
Okay, start working. Okay, forget it. All right, so uh, then uh, the other technology uh, for third generation sequence technology is based on a nanopore. So you can have uh, like another uh, hole, but then uh, you can drive the DNA coming through the hole using an applied electric field. And then, uh, but at the same time, uh, electrical currents can flow through the pore. And then depending on the sequence of the DNA you have, you may have different uh, current levels and that may be used to uh, read a sequence. And in fact, this was kind of proposed almost 20 years ago by uh, some people. And no one really, you know, not, I mean, no one, you know, I, I didn't really take it seriously. Yeah. Uh, but in fact, actually, Alexei Aksmentev in the department, uh, he is a really world expert on nanopore technology based on uh, an extensive research that uh, his group has done. So this, you know, basically you just read the uh, current level of a single DNA molecule going through, and then you read a sequence that uh, has the potential of multi multiplexing and so make it in parallel. And in principle, you can read really, really long DNA molecules. Okay? The read lengths can be thousands or longer in principle. But this has been a kind of, you know, pipe dream for many, many years. And then actually a company in Oxford, UK, they have uh, 200 employees. And they apparently uh, solved uh, a lot of the problems. And almost two years ago, February 2012, uh, at a meeting in Florida, they announced publicly that they developed a uh, sequencing machine based on the nanopore technology. And that is uh, very small. Actually, you can see that it, it, is, it can be connected to, to a, a USB port. Presumably, the hole here is to pipette in your DNA sample. Okay. And uh, they claim that you, you have 800 parallel detection wells and read lengths up to 100,000 nucleotides, and so on. But uh, you know, they haven't published anything yet. And so it's not clear what type of you know, pore that they're using, and also how they are driving the DNS through at a measured uh, pace. And they also claim the accuracy is actually 96%. So we, people have complained that uh, they, they just made an announcement without actually showing that it, it works. And nothing has actually has happened since in the last two years, likely because they also had other issues to solve but apparently they are now uh, uh, trying to uh, send some of the instruments to different labs uh, to, for beta testing. I believe University of Illinois is trying to get one of those. Okay. So if this works really well, maybe this may replace everything. Right? Until the uh, graphene-based nanopores can take over 10 years from now. So it's a really interesting Field. Things are moving so rapidly. Questions? All right, let me uh, <coughs> switch to what is the advantage of graphene based? Okay, so I mean, the idea of nanopore based sequencing is the following so you have a very uh, narrow uh, constriction, narrow hole. And then when the DNA goes through, th then DNA will uh, perturb the current going through. But uh, if, the, if the narrowest part of the pore is you know, really thick, let's say 10 uh, bases of uh, DNA in length, then the, the signal will be averaged about 10 bases of DNA. If it's uh, smaller, thinner, then it, it will average about three or four bases of DNA. But if, if you use a graphene, for example, then you may be averaging only one, over one base, right? That's the potential advantage. OK, now I want to talk about uh, gene expression analysis tools. OK, why uh, do you care about 
gene expression analysis because uh, in many cases it's really not about the gene you know what distinguishes us from chimpanzees not so much that our genes are different it's, it's more that uh, we are different in when and where the genes are expressed. Okay, so this is a question of gene expression regulation or gene regulation. So by uh, looking at the gene expression pattern using these tools, you may be able to uh, see what's different between the normal cells and disease cells, you know, cancer cells or cells infected by you know, HIV, for example, uh, by looking at uh, different gene expression patterns, you may uh, get insight about the underlying cause and potential uh, treatment. You know, maybe you can find a potential drug target based on the gene expression analysis and so on. Okay. So what do you measure in uh, gene expression analysis? Well, clearly, if you simply sequence your DNA, it doesn't tell you anything because it's not about the DNA sequence per se, but what is being produced. So uh, basically, there are two things you can measure mainly. One is an RNA, uh, mainly messenger RNA, and the other is the protein. And protein is, of course, the final outcome, actual player. So ideally, you like to quantify the protein levels accurately, but this is actually more difficult and more laborious. So you know, it's oftentimes prefer to look at the RNA level. And, and this may tell uh, give you in, good enough information about the proteins if there is a direct you know, one-to-one relation between the two, but that is often not the case. Now, if you quantify the mRNA uh, uh, levels at the genome-wide scale you know, for all the genes that you, you have in, in, the, in the organism, then uh, that result is called the trans transcript transcriptome. Okay? So it comes, you know, genome transcriptome. And, and if, you, if you do protein quantification at the genome scale, then you can call it proteome. Okay? So you just add ohm for anything that you quantify if you do it at the genome scale. So in fact, you know, there is a conference called omics conference, genomics, proteomics, and transcriptomics, and so on. And there is a where the really big excitement is because data amount that you get is so big, and you can no longer use your intuition to you know look at the figure and then see what's going on. You have to use massive computational tools to to uh, to analyze them. So in in many cases now, this is probably one area of research where discoveries are made by. Uh, uh, non-experimentalists, right? Because uh, yeah, good ex experimentalists can develop tools to measure these things. You can generate data, but uh, you cannot comprehend the meaning uh, without actually uh, doing serious computation analysis. Okay. So the aha moment, right? Uh, this is how it works. This is what's going on. Uh, can be had by a student doing the computational work, okay? But in most other uh, kind of research, in a hot moment, right, the real discovery is made by, by the, the experimentalist. But this is an area where, you know, things can flip. Okay, what are the main tools for measuring gene expression uh, for RNA and protein? Uh, for RNA, uh, we have RT-PCR, real-time PCR, I'll describe this later. We also have a technology called microarray. And uh, here is kind of illustration that I took from Rob Phillips' textbook. So let's imagine on a surface you have a uh, single cell DNA of a certain sequence sitting here as a cluster. And then you have uh, uh, DNA molecules derived from your cell of interest, but they are labeled with uh, fluorescent dye molecules. Then if there's a matching between the two, then it'll bind to the single cell DNA on the surface, and then this spot on your device will light up. Okay, so then by looking at the fluorescent signal from there, you know, okay, I know what gene this is, and because it lights up, then I must have a lot of that uh, gene uh, RNA produced for that particular gene. 
So that is the idea behind microarray. And I, I'll show you some more details later. And then using the, now the next-gen sequencing technologies, uh, because sequencing is not cheap enough, you can actually sequence RNA directly. You just sequence everything coming from the cell. So that is called the RNA-seq. And I will not uh, discuss this. And there's another method called FISH. That's a cell-based uh, method. And MS2 binding array is another one. And Northern blood is actually the most classical method to detect, quantify uh, RNA molecules. In, in the case of proteins, there's a method called uh, Western blood. And you can see some relation between Western and uh, Northern. Do you know why they're called uh, Northern and Western? So there is a, a, there is a, a method called a Southern blood. Actually, I forgot what Southern blood is for because no one really uses it very much anymore. But uh, that method was uh, invented by uh, Dr. Southern. Okay? And then uh, you know, parallel methods were invented by others. And then they just called it OK, because he called you know, his southern blood, I, I'm going to call it you know, western blood or northern blood. Okay? Uh, so that's actually a gel-based protein quantification method I will not talk about. And uh, you can do fluorescence imaging of cells. For example, if you have a, a E. coli cell uh, containing you know, fluorescent protein labeled gene product, then when that gene is expressed, then you know, it lights up. So by looking at the intensity of individual cells in fluorescence, you, know, you can you know, plot the histone with fluorescence intensity of the individual cells. You can see you know, basic distribution because different cells express different amount of that protein. And some cells are much brighter than, than the others. And we can also you know, quantify the gene expression this way. Of course, when you, when you look at this distribution, you have to uh, be careful about you know, how much of that distribution is actually uh, real uh, biological noise, meaning that really different cells have different amounts of proteins expressed, versus how much of this is coming from the measurement noise. Because your measurement will not be perfect. It will introduce some, some noise, especially if the fluorescence is not very strong. Questions? There's another method uh, called uh, fluorescence uh, flow cytometry. And uh, that doesn't use imaging, but it uses a flow device. And the cells are flowing through a laser, laser beam uh, one at a time. And then laser excites that single cell. And fluorescence from the single cell is measured, actually in multiple different colors. So you can, you can quantify the expression levels of up to like, 20 different proteins. And so, so you can buy an instrument uh, uh, that costs half a million dollars that can do these things. And a lot of the immuno, uh, immunologists are actually using them very uh, widely uh, because there are many different types of immune cells that you can uh, detect and separate based on uh, fluorescence markers. And uh, pr perhaps the most powerful method for uh, protein quantification is uh, called mass spectrometry. And, and that uh, actually method was, uh, is really powerful. And you can actually do a genome-wide protein quantification you know, of 2,000 genes at the same time uh, from yeast, for example. And actually, I was reading about mass spec two years ago. I was so impressed. Wow, it's so powerful. Wow, and, and precise. And I thought, wow, you know, someone should get the Nobel Prize for this. And then I realized that like, someone already has received the Nobel Prize for, uh, uh, for the technology. In fact, there are three Nobel Prize winners that year, I think like five, six, seven years ago. And then one of the winners uh, uh, is, uh, was a Japanese uh, person who uh, was, who actually, who is work, he's just working for, he's a salaryman for a company, a Japanese company, not doing research anymore. Then somehow you know he, he got recognized for, for uh, one of his uh, uh, original contributions, 
And then the most, uh, I guess, you know, exciting recent uh, pro uh, uh, development is called the ribosome profiling. In fact, there was a seminar by uh, Jonathan Weissman, whose lab did, did invented this method. In this case, what you do is that you, you, uh, you collect the ribosomes from cells, and then uh, mRNA molecules that are being copied into proteins by the ribosomes will be uh, bound to the ribosome. And then you can sequence these mRNA molecules and then deduce what genes are being translated. Okay. Turns out that that is actually much better of measure of the protein level than the RNA as seq. So that actually is really, you know, getting really, really uh, uh, exciting. And that, uh, so in fact, uh, I think all his postdocs are highly sought after, you know, becoming professors, Stanford, MIT. Uh, Berkeley and so on. Uh, but I mean, he also told me that here really the difficulty is not actually performing the measurement, it's really getting the, the meaning out of the data. So a lot of the effort is now going into the computational tools to actually analyze the data. Questions? Okay, uh, PCR uh, is a polymerase chain reaction, and and this technique also uh, was recognized by recognized by the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1993, and it was uh, invented by uh, like scientists at a company. Did you hear about this, Mollis? He's kind of crack crackpot scientist. He he still uh, goes around to say that. Uh, HIV is, uh, is not caused by, oh, sorry, a AIDS is not caused by the virus. It's, so it's, he's against the vaccines. I mean, he's kind of a weird scientist, but uh, apparently he was driving on Highway 1 in, uh, in California, and then he came up with this idea, and then he parked the car, and then thought about this more. Okay, I'm going to win the Nobel Prize for this, and then and he won. And it's mainly because you know, this is a method to amplify the DNA, and you know, forensic sciences and so on. Before, you couldn't actually use DNA to to uh, identify a criminal or innocent people because there was just not enough DNA molecules there to to make the distinction, to make the measurement. But now, with this amplification method, you can actually do. Right? So PCR is really, uh, you know, the basis for modern biology. So there are three steps in PCR reaction. So DNA template uh, is repetitively denatured, annealed, and replicated by the polymerase. And so uh, it's denatured at a high temperature, 95 degrees, into single-stranded DNA molecules. And then it's annealed to specific oligonucleotide primers uh, at, at a much lower temperature, typically 55 degrees, and so on. And then uh, and then polymerase uh, copies the DNA uh, you know, you know, to make double chain DNA. And then you then go up in temperature to denature the molecule and then repeat this process many, many times. That's how you do exponential, exponential amplification. So in step one, you have double chain DNA, you melt the DNA at high temperature into two single chain DNA molecules. And then in step two, you uh, go down in temperature and then you anneal uh, short uh, primer DNA molecules here and here. And, and then uh, and then in step three, then DNA polymerase will make a copy in this direction and also here. And then you have two double stranded molecules and then you, you melt, you add primer annealers, and then you do it again. So that you get this continuous amplification. And here the temperature for annealing is critical. This is a silly analogy that if you make the exam uh, too easy, 
then everyone gets 100%. And if you make it too hard, no one passes. Actually, I, I was teaching, I mean, when I teach, teach physics 101, I uh, learned that this is actually not, not true. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, so if your annealing temperature is too uh, low, then uh, then you know the annealing of primers to the uh, template DNA is not as stringent in terms of sequence uh, matching. So you can have uh, false positive. But if temperature is too uh, too high, then you know it does not anneal, and so you can get false negatives. Questions? So PCR uses a thermal cycler. So have, have you seen a thermal cycler in, in a lab? Just a you know, small container like this, like a rice cooker, size of a rice cooker. Yeah. And so actually, you, it's, it's a machine that uh, changes temperature between three different levels all the time. Uh, and and you basically program it so that you can go between three different temperatures and for some durations each. And, and then you do it you know, some number of times. So that is the thermal cycling. You go into high temperature, you melt the DNA. Low temperature, you anneal the DNA to the primer. And then at, in, at an intermediate temperature, the DNA polymer is, uh, copies the DNA. And then do this. So when uh, the Mollis uh, came up with this idea, original demonstration was done by the company, but it was not a very good method because the polymers that they were using would denature here, right? You know, because protein just dies, and uh, you cannot recover that. So then, uh, then when you come back here, then you have to add new polymerases to the tube. You open it, and then you add new polymerases, and then close it again, you that really was not very optimal, so they thought it's not going to take off. And then someone went, you know, so other scientists, they, they went to Yellowstone, whatever, some, some uh, hot springs and so on. They discovered uh, an organism that lives in that high temperature. This means that, you know, if it's boiling temperature, that enzyme, the DNA polymerase, must be still active at that high temperature. It, it should survive this kind of temperature, right? And it, in fact, that enzyme is not active at this temperature. Okay, so if you simply add that enzyme to this tube, and then go up and down, and then here, and then enzyme then uh, works. And then you can do this without actually opening the cap of the tube, and then you can do this many, many times. So that is the idea. So it required, actually, his Nobel Prize required, actually, the discovery of an, you know, hot spring organisms. OK, real-time PCR, just one slide. Now, uh, you know, you have uh, like some genomic DNA or whatever, and you want to know whether a certain sequence is there or not. And then what you do is actually you do PCR reaction in a tube. So you know, for each cycle of you know, thermal cycling, you go from 2 to 4 to 8, right? But then what you do here is that uh, to read the signal in real time, you put uh, some dye molecules in the tube. And uh, in, these are special dye molecules. So they're, they're not really fluorescent. They are very uh, weakly fluorescent in, in free, free in solution. But then when they bind to the DNA, they become like 1,000 times brighter. Okay? So then as you make more and more uh, DNA molecules, then fluorescent signal goes up. Okay? So that's why this is called real-time PCR, PCR, PCR reaction but you read the fluorescent signal in real time while you are doing the thermal cycling. So the signal shown here is you know, for example, one reaction, and this is fluorescent signal, and this uh, number of cycles. Okay, so when you do PCR, it's usually there's not enough material to see anything at the beginning. So you do 15, uh, 15 16 cycles, and you don't see anything, because whatever you have is not above the uh, detection level. But then now, at this point, 17 is things start to go up, okay? Now, if you look at a different sample, it starts to go up at a 
at a la later cycle, let's say this one starts go, to go up, one, two, three, four, five cycles later, what does that mean? The amount of this, that, that DNA in this sample is two to the fifth times lower, lower. Right? Because to, from here to here, these five, five additional cycles, that is uh, 32 fold amplification, right? And then in us, like that. So by, by doing a real time PCR and reading all of the signal, you can uh, clearly see the relative abundance of the original material. Okay. Questions? And this is also called uh, qPCR for maybe quick PCR. But, but this is a really, really popular method that many people use. And because it's not very expensive at all to, to run this, such a test. But of course, this is, you, you can do it for maybe five different genes quickly. But if you want to look at 2,000 genes, this is you know, too slow and too expensive. A you know, graduate student has to pipette this and then run this and then come back and do it again and so on, 2,000 times. So you know, that's why now people use uh, RNA, RNA seq, just sequence entire uh, RNA molecules from your sample. Instead of targeting certain genes, you just sequence everything. Questions? Okay, so uh, now the northern blood. So this is the most uh, classical uh, method, and that's probably is, is the least uh, sensitive, but still being used in some uh, measurements. So the idea is that you have a sample of cells, and you extract your RNA, and then uh, you run it on a gel. So the different RNA molecules uh, run at different speed, and then uh, it's called blot because you can actually blot this gel onto um, a, a membrane. So RNA molecules will be transferred to the membrane. And then you use uh, some treatment to you know, fix the molecules there. And then you come with the DNA molecules that are complementary in sequence to the RNA molecules. And they can, uh, they can anneal to the RNA molecules. So if you have a particular sequence that you're interested in, you label with a radioactive uh, element and then then it goes and uh, decorate that uh, piece of RNA and then if you then uh, use x-ray film to get uh, get a picture of this then wherever you have radi uh, radioactive molecules will light up in the x-ray and then that's how you quantify the amount of RNA you have in your, in your cell okay this is what's nice about this is that there's no amplification right so uh, there's no issue with amplification bias. However, because there's no amplification, it's not as sensitive, okay. even with uh, you know, radioactivity. So this is how you typically do the uh, analysis. So you run a control sample, and this is your experiment. For example, let's, I induce a gene. Let's say I add. Uh, lactose, so IPTG, to induce the expression of a certain gene that was originally repressed by lactose repressor. You know, let's say that. Now I want to comp compare the two. By what fold does the gene expression go up? So what you do is that you do a northern blood of the control sample and your uh, uh, real experiment. And this is the target gene that you are trying to measure. And then your X-ray film shows that this is actually 10 times brighter here than here, right? But that's not enough because when you collect the sample amount from the control and your real experiment, maybe the input is different in, in the amount. So that's why you have to do another experiment in another uh, probe here to, to uh, look at the control genes. So these are the genes that are always expressed by the cell at the same level, more or less. So they are called the housekeeping genes. You know, it doesn't matter whether, you know, it's a holiday or, or whatever, work day. You have to keep the house in order. So they are always expressed at the same level. So, but, and then it turns out that this guy is 
twice as highly expressed than, than the control, but they must be the same. So then you can uh, normalize this by this factor of two, and then you say that, okay, correspond, corrected fold increase is five. So again, uh, this method is nice because you don't need to amplify, but it's, it's not nice because you don't, you don't, you don't get the amplification. Okay? It's, not very, you have to have, it's not very sensitive. You know? It's very, you know, it's very actually hard to get very clean signal unless RNA is pretty abundant. Questions? Okay, DNA microarray. So what uh, I told you, uh, like the principle behind the microarray. I mean, uh, let me go back. But but it's called the array because you have array of spots, but each spot contains. You know, basically, uh, immobilized DNA molecules of a particular uh, sequence, a particular gene, and then when when the sample binds there, then you see, okay, you have a certain amount of that gene. So that's the idea. So usually, what you do is that you do two uh, experiments side by side. Let's say th this can be a control or it can be the real experiment. Let's say this is a normal cell, and this is a breast cancer cell, and you want to see. Uh, the difference between the gene expression pattern. Okay? And then what you do is that you collect RNA uh, from the normal cells and breast cancer cells, RNA extraction, and then uh, you do cDNA reaction. You know what cDNA is? C stands for complementary DNA. So what you do is that you use an enzyme called reverse transcriptase that makes DNA based on RNA. And then uh, the DNA that you make that way is called cDNA because it's complementary to the RNA sequence. And, and then uh, the <coughs> next thing that you do is that, that you do uh, IVT. IVT, do you know what IVT is? Uh, it's an in vitro transcription. So you basically uh, use that cDNA as a template, and then you uh, make uh, RNA. But when you make the RNA, you use uh, nucleotide, in this case cytosine, CTP, labeled with a dye of a green color, and then this is labeled with a dye of red color. Okay? So the, what it is is that then uh, the RNA molecules, uh, you know, th these probes uh, that are derived from the normal cells are labeled with green, and the cancer cell derived uh, probes are made, labeled with red. Okay, and then they, co they go and bind to the same spot. Let's say this gene is for, um, what is your favorite gene? Okay, do you know any gene? IL 28B. Huh? Interleukin 28B. You like uh, I, IL-20B, okay, IL-28B. Okay, let's say that this is the one. Okay, that's this one, okay. This part is green. What it means is that in the normal cell, you, you have a lot of gr the expression of that interleukin 28B. But in the cancer cell, it doesn't get expressed. Right. So you see a big, big difference when you see a green spot. When you see a yellow spot, what does that mean? They express at the same level in the normal versus cancer cell. And when you see red, what does that mean? It's only expressed in cancer cells. Cancer cells, cells right? So that is a very useful information. And you can get this you know, on the genome scale very quickly, right? just look, looking at the color. Okay, uh, I, I, I show you a couple, one more slide, but it turns out that uh, that these methods that are invented uh, in the uh, 90s, the mid 90s, and so on, are, are actually becoming obsolete. They are getting taken over by uh, 
uh, RNA seq, just se sequence everything, cheap a lot, right? And and I think that that transition will be complete with probably in two or three years because then sequence will become even cheaper. So this is one of those artifacts that uh, probably is seen only temporarily. You know, you know single sequencing is gone, right? You know but not use anymore in a major sequencing facilities. And this also will, will disappear. But really, you, you form the basis of high, high throughput genome-wide analysis gene expression because this is the first, actually, way of doing that. Okay? So in a sense, this is more like a, a airway for TV transmission. So uh, you know, already, you know, you know, some years from now, there will be no air, you know, air, TV transmitted by airwave, right? So if you, if you have a satellite somewhere and then trying to look at, that. so now everything is done by you know, cables and so on, right? So you have only maybe 40, year, 40 five, 50 years of window when you had airwaves, right? That uh, did the TV, and it may happen to this technology too. In fact, there's a, a competing technology by a company called Affymetrix. And this is actually already, you know, more or less gone. Company is actually either gone, da gone down or bought by somebody else. So this is just to uh, give you, uh, you know, a little bit more information. Again, you have your normal cell versus cancer cell. But it can be anything you want. It can be a normal cell versus cells infected with uh, HIV virus. And and then you get a signal that's, that looks like this, and you just look at the ratio between green and red. And uh, when, uh, when uh, it's red, uh, you have high ratio. When it's green, you have negative ratio. And what, can, what you can also do is to use uh, uh, clustering algorithms to cluster different genes based on the expression pattern. Okay? So you can do not only two experiments, you can do many, many experiments. And then, uh, let's say, as a function of you know, virus infection time, then then different genes that are actually changing together can be clustered, and that can give you some additional information about what's going on. Questions? All right, so uh, because the time is up, so I, I stop here, continue on Thursday.